It's okay, man. Give me a hug, yeah. In many respects, the open world genre that Rockstar Games innovated sparked an overwhelming amount of controversy throughout the last two decades. This much especially holds true since bans and the ceaseless discourse surrounding violent video games continue to plague Grand Theft Auto. Red Dead Redemption is no stranger to similar criticism, and it doesn't help that players of these franchises typically assume the role of career criminals, men who, for one reason or another, often find themselves partaking in deplorable acts. But Bully once saw the company exercise its free-roaming expertise beyond the realm of criminality to craft a different kind of sandbox adventure, one wherein over-the-top violence did not sit center stage. Bully still received far more than its fair share of backlash, however. The name alone ruffled the feathers of various organizations, politicians, and anti-bullying activists around the globe. Before the public had even seen the game in action, a series of relatively tame screenshots caused a stir, culminating in Bully being dubbed a Columbine simulator. Yet despite the contrived drama, this particular Rockstar project remains secure in its status as a fan favorite. It's rather unique, too. In between schoolyard-level mayhem, classes, and the occasional clever prank, players adopt the role of hero, standing up to bullies, though never actually playing the part. As such, Bully is more than a misunderstood classic, a game whose pre-release existence was bombarded with the most undeserving negativity. This is the history of Bully. Because you know what happens to liars? No, no, I'm not lying. We kick them in the balls! <laughs> Rockstar Vancouver, the studio responsible for Bully's creation, initially emerged in the industry as Barking Dog Studios in 1998. A small group of former Radical Entertainment developers founded the company, producing only a handful of titles under its original name, including the tactical first-person shooter Global Operations and real-time strategy title Treasure Planet Battle at Procyon. Rockstar Games' parent company, Take-Two Interactive, acquired the Vancouver-based crew of roughly 50 developers in the summer of 2002. The purchase positioned Barking Dog under Rockstar's label as Rockstar Vancouver, consequently resulting in Rockstar Canada's adoption of its widely known Toronto moniker to avoid confusion. Though Bully was the first Rockstar Vancouver game to hit store shelves, an entry in the Spec Ops franchise likely counted as its inaugural project under the Take-Two banner. Production on the mysterious Spec Ops installment reportedly began in 2003, before it unceremoniously landed on the cutting room floor in 2005. Bully's early days were in play around the same time as the Spec Ops production. As a group with no background in developing the kind of titles in Rockstar's wheelhouse, Rockstar Vancouver recruited Mike Scupa, a former Radical Entertainment designer and friend to several team members. With the likes of Jackie Chan's Stuntmaster and the Hulk on his resume, Scupa, as one of two principal designers, proved an integral addition to a studio that needed someone skilled in crafting action-centric experiences for consoles. In Patrick Hickey Jr.'s The Minds Behind the Games, Scupa noted that development on Bully was an intense ordeal from the start. On his first day at the office, for example, key staff were absorbed by another team to assist with a game that was further along in terms of progress. Staff turnover continued to disrupt development in a manner Scupa was unfamiliar with forcing colleagues to bond quickly as new members were shuffled in and out at an unusually high rate. Rockstar Vancouver's troubles veered far beyond that which it had to endure early on. Creatively, Bully represented a phenomenal time in his career, Scupa said in Eurogamer's 2019 retrospective. On the other hand, the designer and some of his co-workers often found themselves burnt out from routinely working 80-hour weeks. And because Rockstar Games had such high ambitions, the Vancouver group felt as though they were constantly being pushed to raise the bar. Contention primarily arose whenever expectation from Rockstar's headquarters in New York failed to correlate with production deadlines. Furthermore, Scupa claimed the desires of higher-ups were occasionally incongruent with the type of experience Rockstar Vancouver wanted to create. The love-hate relationship between the two divisions grew more strained as time wore on especially during instances in which the Vancouver office rarely heard from supervisors in New York. Whenever Rockstar HQ did reach out, 
The bully developers were typically advised to shift the course of development, leading to what Scooper referred to as an extreme amount of overtime. While various staffers happily worked longer than the norm, many others resented having to do the same. Issues of this nature weighed heavily on the crew, who at times feared Bully would be cancelled. There were even instances wherein Scoopa considered leaving altogether, yet endured because he believed they were laying the foundation of a genuinely special piece of entertainment. It wasn't until marketing for Bully got underway that tensions between the two studios finally dissipated, allowing developers to become more confident in their game's future. In the end, Rockstar Vancouver shipped the free-roaming adventure the small team had its heart set on releasing into the wild. Cool. Just get me a part for my radio and I'll show you what the army taught me. What, like how to get shot by your own side? Exactly. Regardless of what onlookers may have assumed at the time, Bully wasn't designed as a response to widespread criticism that Grand Theft Auto corrupted young, impressionable minds. Rather, it originated as a passion project for developers who wanted to explore the social nuances of high school. Similar to the way these elements are portrayed in John Hughes's teen films, such as Sixteen Candles and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Thematically, however, the version of Bully that launched in October of 2006 was not in the Vancouver studio's early plans. In fact, because of the sensitive subject matter, the crew had a difficult time agreeing on a core design. For the first half of development, Bully featured a more cartoony look and attitude, accentuated by a darker doggy dog tone. Even the design of protagonist Jimmy Hopkins changed wildly over time, as he closely resembled antagonist Gary Smith in a previous incarnation. Scoopa also cited the varying high school experiences of staff members as cause for the tone and design disagreements. Yet, their diverse backgrounds eventually grew to inform much of what made Bully so memorable. Talks about high school memories began with Scoopa and designer Tony Lavery. Their reflections on days gone by inspired the game's tonal shift, which then culminated in an uplifting theme that centered on the human spirit and overcoming the odds. Other staffers shared personal stories as well, fueling quite a few of Bully's strongest gameplay and mission ideas. Common childhood events like paper routes and running from authority figures and peers proved essential to recapturing the wonderment of youth. Each true-to-life moment, every precious memory, both positive and negative, demanded attention to a degree. In addition to boxing, lock-picking, and kart racing minigames, a small team devoted a considerable amount of time and effort into developing arcade games. Replete with levels, music, and noteworthy details, the arcade games were built with quality in mind. No one wanted side activities to feel cheap, Rockstar producer Geronimo Barrera divulged in an EGM interview. As a result, several arcade ideas failed to make the final cut, either for gameplay-related reasons or because the studio simply ran out of time. Barrera noted that an arcade title based on Bully's Grottos and Gremlins role-playing game counts as an example of something cut as the clock wound down. When all was said and done, every detail coalesced to form a fully realized open world configured around a day in the life of teenagers. However, success in this regard rid neither Rockstar nor its Vancouver label of drama. Little did they know there was still the matter of surviving press, politicians, and activists that would quickly jump the gun and assume the absolute worst about the studio's heartfelt and comedic debut adventure. Well, Jimmy, word on the street is you're something of a pugilist. No, sir, I never pugilized in my life. Really? And that you've been saying some entertaining things about me and some barnyard animals? No, I never said that. Well, I listen to things, Hopkins. You try and stay out of trouble. Now go see the cook down in the kitchen. Take Two Interactive announced Bully in May 2005, touting it as Rockstar Vancouver's brutally funny debut title. Originally meant to launch that October on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, the new IP boasted an unorthodox premise for an open-world game. Players would assume the role of 15-year-old Jimmy Hopkins, a troublesome Bullworth Academy student who stood up to bullies, enjoyed a good prank, and got picked on by teachers, all while navigating social dynamics at reform school. The plot synopsis itself didn't raise too many eyebrows, but the release of screenshots during E3 inadvertently kicked the hornet's nest. Reportedly, a screenshot of Jimmy kicking another student in the backside unsettled several activists. By August 2005, anti-bullying campaigns were calling for an outright ban on Bully's release. Liz Cornell, then a spokesperson for Bullying Online, told BBC News Bully bore an unsuitable theme that was an insult to victims. 
Other activists shared similar concerns with a youth group known as the Peaceaholics, holding a protest outside of Rockstar's New York headquarters. Most notably, the protesters demanded the title's cancellation. Additional requests were for Rockstar to start exclusively selling as mature games in adults-only video stores. A studio representative responded to the backlash by asking the bully be judged, like any other fictional piece of media. Furthermore, the team wanted to discuss the game's content with anti-bullying organizations once production wrapped up, even inviting bullying online members to see the project in action for themselves. But this display of goodwill on Rockstar's part did little to stem the tide of controversy. Unsurprisingly, now disbarred Florida attorney anti-violent video game activist Jack Thompson hijacked the conversation before long. Months after E3 2005, Thompson appeared in a CNN segment on Lou Dobbs Tonight, condemning Bully as a game starring a victim who becomes the victimizer. He then went on to groundlessly compare the player character to the Columbine shooters. Later in the segment, CNN correspondent Lisa Sylvester told viewers Thompson had deemed the Rockstar title a Columbine simulator, a descriptor that remains synonymous with his perception of the game. Thompson's crusade didn't stop there either. In September of 2005, Rockstar postponed Bully past its October release to a nebulous 2006 launch. Protests and other controversies weren't the motivating factor, company spokesman Rodney Walker insisted. The delay was instead brought about by the creative process, as well as a commitment to delivering groundbreaking entertainment. Following the lengthy delay, much of the Bully-related drama took a hiatus. It returned in full force in August of 2006, however, once Rockstar unleashed the first trailer and unveiled an October 2006 release date for the PS2 version. In turn, the floodgates reopened with another Peaceaholics demonstration outside of Take-Two's office in Manhattan. Anti-bullying activists denounced the project's impending arrival as an irresponsible move, which they feared would have grave repercussions. Take-Two's renewed efforts eventually provoked the return of Jack Thompson. He brought with him a lawsuit, demanding an advanced copy to determine whether Bully might influence copycat violence in schools, with his ultimate goal being a ban on its release via Florida's nuisance laws. When questioned by Ars Technica about the lighthearted trailer, Thompson characterized it as a propaganda effort worthy of Joseph Goebbels or Doug Lowenstein. Thompson didn't alter his stance when, in Europe and other power regions, Bully received a new title, Canis Canemedit a Latin phrase that translates to dog-eat-dog. -dog. He and fellow activists were not moved by the ESRB's T for Teen rating either, nor was Thompson willing to concede after a Florida judge issued an order for a review copy, then later ruled that Bully featured no more violence than what children saw on TV. But the lawyer was forced to yield amid a contempt of court charge filed by Take-Two, which led to further legal disputes before ending in an April 2007 settlement. The agreement saw both parties drop their respective lawsuits, effectively ending Thompson's fruitless crusade. Hey, I saw you sucking up the Crabble Snitch. What? Shut up! Screw you, new kid! This is what we do to teachers' pets around here. You better not. Ow! <laughs> Come here, you dick! Hopkins, you're pathetic! Fascinating, is it? Pay attention! I'm sorry, you're not touching me. Plenty had been said about Bully before it hit store shelves. Much of the noise proved to be unwarranted when reviews arrived in the fall of 2006. As opposed to a Columbine simulator, critics and players were met with a charming experience unlike anything Rockstar had previously produced. Most considered Jimmy Hopkins a likable character, relatable even, similar to the kind of kid many people probably knew in high school. Thanks to Jimmy and the backdrop of Bullworth Academy, as well as its diverse cast of characters, Many critics argued Rockstar Vancouver excelled in delivering a package that reflected the general annoyance of being a teenager. This excellence was underscored by an incredible attention to detail, pronounced in the environments, gameplay, and vast selection of minigames. You look like you throw like a girl! Though gameplay overall felt smoother in comparison to earlier Grand Theft Auto entries, critics and players alike agreed the controls were rather clunky. On the other hand, opinions were mixed on Bully's linearity. Some enjoyed the clear-cut narrative. Others would have preferred more player agency, especially in terms of the cliques Jimmy could join. This lack of choice additionally factored into hollow dating sequences. 
Bully's praise-laden reviews didn't halt the controversy, despite its minimal inclusion of vices such as foul language, alcohol, and drug use. Its release actually ushered in new points of contention due to a kiss Jimmy could share with another boy. Trouble sparked once more on the eve of Bully Scholarship Edition's launch for the Wii and Xbox 360 in 2008. Yet again, Rockstar found itself having to wade through the murky waters of activists and political figures, hurling false accusations about the content. Oh. None of the backlash kept developers from at least attempting to pursue a sequel. Late in 2019, anonymous sources reportedly familiar with Rockstar's operations told Video Games Chronicle that studio co-founder Dan Hauser and a small group penned a script for Bully 2. The crew allegedly tackled the concept in 2008. Apparently, the script opened with Jimmy's stepfather's house as its setting. A separate source claimed Hauser and company could never pin down a full arc for Jimmy, though there were supposedly talks of another tale centered around either high school or college. Bully 2 never came to fruition, but another sequel project cropped up between the releases of Red Dead Redemption and GTA 5. According to VGC sources, Rockstar New England spearheaded a build of the game that remained in production for 12 to 18 months. Though the New England studio created a playable slice using Rockstar's Rage Engine, further attempts at progress eventually fizzled out. Rumors concerning Bully 2 resurface every so often, and fans are eager to jump at any nugget of information no matter how insubstantial. The eagerness for another installment certainly seems justified, given that only a select few interactive experiences have managed to faithfully depict teen drama in a high school setting. Plus, players who stepped into the shoes of Jimmy Hopkins as teens themselves are now adults. The adults who played them are presently older, wiser. They've settled down. Not to mention there's a new generation of gamers completely unaware of Bully's existence. As each demographic matured, so too did video games. If Rockstar, with its now masterful storytelling, were to take another trek through the hallowed halls of Bullworth Academy, what narrative might the studio tell that can ring true across multiple generations? Hopefully, we'll one day find out. Thank you for watching our video. Our documentaries are crowdfunded and made possible by your continued support for us. We'd like to thank by name the generous patrons who have pledged to our highest reward tier. Caleb Shishkevich, Darirap Sigurdsson, EmuMovies.com, Maktoum Saeed Al Maktoum, Matt Allen, Milkshake, Timur Turisbekov, Viper N95. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and joining us on Patreon. Thank you.